that let me reintroduce Gansu to you. He's been a regular in our community. He's very well read when it comes to Western esotericism and um, esotericism in general. Uh, Inokin is his primary study and practice these days, I believe. So um, yeah, this is his home turf. Um, and I hope you will enjoy um, his presentation. Um, last week we had part one of Gansu's two-part uh, series on um, Inokin magic. It went more into the history. Okay, Gansu, uh, again, thank you for being here and uh, have fun. Well, let's get started. Okay, so um, I will not reintroduce the system. Uh, we already had the part two, and if you missed it, then you can just watch it on YouTube later. But shortly speaking, Enochian magic is a form of visionary magic that came about in uh, uh, during the 16th and early 17th century. Um, the uh, picture that you can see right now uh, displays John Dee and Edward Kelly, who um, during the scrying sessions were communicating with angels and as such um, getting a hold of the system. So uh, what you see here is very similar to what Enochian magic looks like um, actually in practice. One of the things, uh, before we also go into details, I guess, um, Enochian magic is a bit different from the other systems, not just in the methodology itself, but, but also um, it has a slightly different philosophy. Generally speaking, when we talk about magic, we think of trying to bend reality to our will. But in Enochian magic, since it is um, based in the Christian worldview, what we actually see is that you as, an, as a magician are a servant of God. And so everything you do, all sorts of magical operations, uh, all sorts of commandments uh, by which you use angels, all of that is centered around God's will, not your will. Of course, mystically speaking, we are one with God, and this whole system is also um, partly um, a method of realizing that. But to keep that in mind, that very often angels um, don't quite want to do what we want to want them to do. That's a very important thing. Uh, one more thing I will uh, add here. Um, since it is a form of visionary magic, uh, which is, in a sense, quite unique. I mean, we see a lot of magical grimoires which talk about summoning spirits and um, talking to them. None of them really explain what it means to summon those spirits. Generally speaking, uh, there's a lot of talking about manifestation. Uh, in the modern times, we um, interpret that as a form of... Um, I guess, visionary experience or one where we have astral senses to communicate with those spirits. So in, in Enochian magic, it's very explicit. It's a visionary form of magic. Uh, everything, every kind of operation um, leads to having visions or sometimes a full dreamlike experience uh, with all the senses which um, allow us to not only communicate with those beings, sometimes even experience certain very strange um, states of consciousness. And although I said that it's a rather unique um, form of magic, um, this is actually not entirely true. And what the angels say is that the patriarch in the Bible, the pa patriarchs uh, also were uh, private to this kind of methodology. They were actually experiencing visions, uh, and those visions were where the Bible, Bible came from. So uh, the story about uh, the Bible is, you know, uh, interpreted in this mystical, magical um, scheme of things, as angels presented it. Um, and some would argue that this is, you know, just some uh, magical interpretation. However, one important thing that we know about um, the Bible is that it's, it's based on previous traditions known as, well, Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian, Assyrian, that kind of stuff. And if we read those earlier myths, 
we have uh, an earlier form of magic in Sumerian tradition called Ashipu. And this also has a separate, um, few separate functions, such as a scribe, uh, some, somebody who is um, dealing with like invocations or songs. And we have visionaries. Uh, those visionaries or scryers like Edward Kelly were called Baru. Uh, and the art they were performing was called Barutu. Like Ashipu means uh, a magician or a exorcist. And Ashiputu means the art of exorcism. So it's very interesting that this tradition is kind of revived thousands of years later by Jundi and the angels. Um, and especially important or relevant fact here is that um, in the earlier Sumerian traditions, the um, visionaries, Baru, uh, they were said to descend from um, the seventh pre-flood king called, called Enmadurana or Enmaduranki. There are like different um, spellings of like different uh, readings of uh, scripts in like Sumerian and uh, Babylonian. So you might know um, that, well, obviously Enochian comes from the seventh uh, pre-flood a uh, patriarch called Enoch, or Enoch. Uh, and what we know about these two characters, Enoch uh, and, and Madurana, is that they pretty much match themselves. Uh, we don't have that many, um, that much information about both of them. But from what we have, they were both quite similar um, to each other. So comparative religion usually says that they are the same person. And what's extremely interesting is that in the um, early Jewish mythology, we find Enoch to be um, a practitioner of some form of visionary magic again. He ascends heaven, and being such a holy person as he was, he was um, said to become an angel or, well, assume an angelic um, post in heaven. And as he did, so he became the angel or archangel Metatron. Now, um, if you look at these two names, Metatron and, and Madurana, you see something interesting. So the prefix N in and Madurana means something like Lord or Prince is a title, basically. So if we cut the thing, we have Madurana, which is very similar to Metatron, uh, if you read it from the the actual like Hebrew. So in Hebrew, there are no vowels. Um, so um, the, the word Metatron, as it is written, actually spells something like Mitron. It's very similar sounding to Madurana. It sounds like the word Metatron actually comes from it. And what's interesting is that no scholars of the Hebrew language uh, have any idea of like where the, the, the name Metatron could come from because it's so weird. So not Hebrew-like, it's almost like it actually comes from another language. Uh, so with this long um, introduction, we see that this tradition, although it is technically from the 16th century, um, it has roots in traditions from thousands years earlier, which John Dee and Kelly could possibly, couldn't possibly have any idea about. I guess also the idea that the magician is kind of like a servant is very similar to shamanism. I mentioned it already in the first presentation, but yeah, we see that this idea of um, Enochian magic, this, this whole uh, philosophy of Enochian magic is something that actually has roots in earlier traditions. The Enochian system uh, is often divided into three different parts. These three different parts are something that is um, more of a modern invention. Uh, however, people, uh, well, some people try to argue that there are some um, clues as to this division being actually um, invented by the angels, but I'm not really um, convinced. Nevertheless, um, we could see that there are three different uh, main or large parts of the system as well as a few smaller ones, which are nowadays generally ignored. So we see 
in the diaries, we, we see a lot of um, alchemical procedures, um, very cryptic sometimes, difficult to uh, reason about. Um, obviously, nowadays, alchemy is kind of um, ignored, I guess, in general. So no, no, I'm not a surprise that it's also like this in this case. We also find lots of random rituals and talismans with um, more like a classic um, magical form of operation, basically, you know, doing some um, actions with some tools, with some um, chemical uh, substances or whatever, um, as well as talismans of very classical uh, Solomonic kind, even uh, some weird squibbles written on some parchment of, or some, I don't know, piece of wood or metal, uh, and they usually are um, focused on some particular goal, some particular material result. There's also lots of um, ciphers in the Nokian diaries, um, ciphers that some of which have not been uncovered and some of which are not even uh, clear what they are meant to be. So um, there's a lot of stuff still uh, to be uncovered. Um, so by the virtue of it being unknown, um, it's not, again, surprising that some of these things are rather um, ignored. So the main three um, parts of the system that most of us nowadays are occupied with are called, uh, one of them is uh, Heptarchia Mystica, the first one. Uh, the second being Liber Logath, or Logach, as the angels say. And Enochiana, uh, which is, I guess, what most of people nowadays consider Enochian magic. So even from these three, um, three main parts of the system, the first two actually are often ignored as well. Um, part of that is because these systems uh, weren't exactly um, explained what they are meant to do, and we'll get to that in a moment. But also because there's a lot of either missing um, documents about them or um, because some uh, modern practitioners, particularly the uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, kind of ignored them themselves. And so since they only popularized the third final part of the system, only that one got kind of popular, I guess. Um, so there are methods of working with these other systems or, well, attempts uh, of doing so. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. First, uh, we'll talk about the, the first part, which is the Heptarchia Mystica, uh, or Heptarchy. Um, the word Heptarchy means basically Hept 7, uh, Arc Ruler, or Ruling. Um, so basically, it's a system of seven rulers. Uh, easy to guess it corresponds to the seven classical planets like in astrology and well many other grimoires and in fact this part of the system is most similar to what we know from other um, ancient and medieval books so there's lots of um, talismans or some kind of tools like things like you see here uh, for example the golden uh, talisman here or uh, Sigillum de MF, as you can see there. Um, the golden ring over there on the right, uh, which is an important tool of this um, subsystem. And also things like the scrying mirror and so on. So these tools are extremely important in the system. Um, they were either given or dictated um, to John D, I mean the instructions on how to make them. So uh, we're going to shortly analyze each of these tools because there's a lot of symbolism in them, which in most grimoires we don't really see. Like we, we, we are given some sort of tool and nobody tells us what it's m meant to do or like where all those um, symbols come from. And the Enochian system is very different from that. It actually describes a lot. So it's uh, interesting to see how these things have come into being. 
oh, I guess uh, one of the things, the golden ring um, was given or maybe dictated um, to Jundi by Archangel Michael. And that's also important because Michael seems to be um, like the um, Kabbalistic exorcist or like patron of exorcism. That's important for two reasons. One, um, well, we see pretty much everywhere, both in the Bible and like other grimoires, like the books of Solomon, the Testament of Solomon. Archangel, Archangel Michael is the one usually giving um, this kind of tools to the magician. Uh, so, for example, the concept of Solomonic ring was also um, something that originated from Archangel Michael, like we see that in the Testament of Solomon. So it's very interesting that we see that here as well. Uh, it's, it's almost like we could say canon. <laughs> and um, it's also important for the other reason, because like I said earlier, um, since this magical art seems to um, refer to some earlier forms of magic, like uh, exorcism, Ashiputu, um, it's very interesting that we also have the chief uh, heavenly exorcist as the patron of this system. So, um, the tool that we have seen on the previous slide, the one over there with like the um, little yellowish um, thick disc, uh, Siglum Diameth, it's made of wax and uh, um, it has this massive heptagram on it with lots of different names and symbols and yeah, it's kind of complex. Um, I guess we won't go into all the details, but I'll uh, give you a rough idea of how it was constructed. Um, this symbol um, has massive hierarchy of angels, some of which also later on communicated with uh, Dean Kelly. Uh, so for example, uh, here you can see Madimi, uh, which has a massive, massive impact on the system. Similarly, uh, Hagenel, uh as well as Ave over there. These are some of the angels that uh, Dean Kelly communicated with very closely. Uh, they even kind of considered them friends to some extent, I guess. Um, and these angels first uh, were first revealed on this diagram. So, um, how did we get that? First of all, um, Kelly had a massive vision of 40 angels or some sort. Um, showing himself, uh, show, showing themselves to him in a row and each of them would basically step out of the line and uh, something like um, take clothes like bar in their chests and he would see the uh, letter. Then the angels would confirm this letter um, audibly and also say uh, what number is uh, related to that letter or associated with it. And so uh, all the uh, rectangles in the outer ring were gotten in a way like this, more or less. Um, then D got, uh, uh, sorry, Kelly or D uh, um, got the table with um, squares with letters seven by seven. You can see it on the top of there. Um, if you read the first column um, from top to bottom, you might actually see it reads Zafkiel. Um, well, so the L is in the second column. Uh, and if you read the next name in the same manner, you get Zedekiel. Um, and so these are uh, the seven, um, I guess, again, classic grimoiric Kabbalistic uh, archangels uh, connected to the seven uh, spheres of planets. Um, so we see um, these angels uh, arranged in a table where we read not the columns, but rather the rows. So the first, well, row, I cannot really read it because it's like, it's um, Z, Z, L, L, R, R, and so on. Um, but we see those in the um, top ring, um, like the uh, outermost ring, except for the uh, 40 um, rectangles. Then we have another table which has a similar pattern, uh, although here what we see is um, there are several ways of arranging the letters. Um, so if we look at the corner here, we have the letter S and 
and the letter S itself is the letter S itself is considered um, a name in this case. Then we go to the next letter, and that's A, and we go um, diagonally to B. So we have AB, that's another ma name. Uh, we can see um, AB over there, just below here. And we keep going with ATH. Again, it's uh, right over here. So we go from this corner and until we reach the middle, we, where we get the, to the name uh, LMS, or I guess SMLE. Uh, and we can do this operation from different corners as well. And that's how we um, reach different um, names on the uh, heptagram and the various um, um, rings of it, I guess. Uh, it's often con considered that these names um, are something like um, accumulation of a single beam, like they are kind of connected. And indeed, the angels themselves describe them as sons of light, daughters of light, and sons of sons of light, and daughters of daughters of light. So they kind of like a one big family, I guess. It's also interesting that some of these angels are actually um, mentioned in the um, later operations to be um, some of the angels we already know. So, for example, the angel Me or Me. Um, is a short for Medicina Dei, which means Health of God, or Medicine of God, which is also the name of um, the Archangel Raphael in Hebrew. Raph mean, um, meaning health or uh, healing, and El means God. So, um, similarly, I guess, Hagonel over there is uh, an angel which we'll later see in... Um, another part of the system. And that's the part. So, um, here on the left, you see a table called uh, Angelorum Bonorum. Uh, it's a table of 49 angels, um, planetary angels, um, Bonorum being uh, good, so good uh, angels. Each of the seven sections on this table um, describes, uh, well, corresponds to one of the planets. I guess, uh, to give you an example, you can see that, um, from the top of each section, we have, um, names, um, which could correspond to, again, different planets. So there are, like, planets within planets, um, so the first one would be the king, and then the second one would be the prince. But what's interesting in the Enochian system is that the kings aren't exactly corresponding to the planet's sun, as it is in the other traditions. They are actually corresponding to Venus, and the princes correspond to the sun. That's again an interesting uh, distinction because um, it more ali aligns more with the uh, ancient Sumerian magic, where uh, Inanna or Ishtar is the um, main goddess of um, the seven um, spheres of the underworld. I see a question there. We'll uh, get to the questions in a second, all right? Um, all right. So these... Um, 49 angels, or actually um, the kings and princes from um, this hierarchy, are then again arranged uh, into a table, like over here. These uh, names are basically, um, well, one thing easy to notice is that each of these names starts with a B. So we cut off these Bs, and then we arrange these um, letters, uh, the, the remaining letters, into seven rows of um, um, read, read, read from right to left the name of the king. So uh, in the in, in, uh, uh, upper, upper right corner we have Bobogel Bobo and uh, Bornobo, Bornogo, sorry. Um, 
and these are uh, uh, the names of the kings and princes. However, one thing that you might notice is that um, they are kind of out of order in here. So uh, Bobogal and Bornogo aren't exactly matching. Like if we look here, uh, where are they? Bobogal over there actually corresponds to Bifafos, um, not to Bornogo. Bornogo actually corresponds to Baligo over there. So Baligon and Bonogo um, are out of sync in a sense. I mean, all of them are. So we see Bonogo over here, but we see Baligon over there. Um, speaking of um, Baligon and Bonogo, uh, they are related to that uh, angel Hagonel I mentioned earlier. Um, so they are out of sync and they read from right to left. Uh, in this form, uh, we can detach these letters, and if you look at the lamen on the top over there, um, you can see that, for example, the letters O and L that we can see here uh, are also on the top of the lamen itself. So all the letters that you can see over there are just letters from this table scrambled into some pattern. Uh, on the left side over there, we can see the same uh, graph with Enochian letters. Uh, we'll get to the Enochian alphabet in a moment. So, this, um, so like I said, this tool over here is the Enochian Lamen. Uh, it's one of the tools, just like the Enochian Ring, that they used for, um, well, used during this operation. We don't know exactly what's uh, its purpose. Um, in some other there is um, related to another lemon. It's said to be some sort of protection, but um, it's not exactly relevant to this particular diagram, probably, or at least we cannot tell for sure. Um, these forty-nine beings are a hierarchy that again can be summoned and used for well all sorts of magical operations. I guess it's a kind of classical in how the um, hierarchy here works. It's just, you know, each angel has its own office, its, its own um, uh, ways of doing things and its own purpose, I guess, its own powers. Uh, I personally haven't worked with this hierarchy myself too much. Um, I just, yeah, I tried these, but uh, I didn't feel uh, particularly attracted to them. Nevertheless, it's a uh, Big part of the system that many people use. What we see on the right is the holy table of the Enochian system. We could see also, you can see here on this slide, the holy table here is actually, you know, uh, used as, a actual, as an actual table. Everything else lies on it. Um, that's, I guess, its purpose pretty much. Um, this pattern of like having a hexagram and uh, all the other um, tools laid out on it. They are, um, it's something that is actually um, familiar with like other, other systems. So we can see a very similar pattern in uh, the book of Amadel and probably several others. Um, what is obviously very unique is the Enochian characters here, uh, but it wasn't like that uh, to begin with. Uh, it was actually using just blotting characters at, at first. Um, Seven thingies around it, I'll explain in a second. Uh, first, before, before we go to um, well, the thing also, also that you can see on the left here. Um, this table also is an arrangement of the previous, um, previous table of letters that you see on the bottom right. Um, so, by fixing these rows to actually match the kings and the princes, we get, so then Baligon would be at the top, um, basically just um, rearranging them, swapping the order pretty much, and then uh, turning it around and taking out the middle part. This middle part becomes this, what you see, what you see right here, right? It's a uh, four by three, and here it's also four by three or three by four. And all the letters uh, around it um, become these letters again. 
with the exception of the uh, letters in the corners, which are basically, um, they, they are the letter B, and you will see that the letter B, as you can also see here, is kind of um, important, I guess, in this system. It's, it's just very prominent. It's everywhere. Um, so what you see here is called an ensign of creation. Um, there's seven of them. I'm not going to show you all of them because I don't really see a point in doing that. Um, but um, as you can see, it's extremely complex. There's lots of just random numbers and letters. And frankly, nobody knows um, the entirety, uh, what the entirety of it means. We only find a few bits. Um, nevertheless, these things are not quite random. We can actually see that they are connected to both the previous and the later works. So for, for example, here on this ensign, in the corner, the upper left corner, um, you can see something like a cross with a letter B and B and uh, number two and three. Um, and this is actually later on used as a, um, I guess, banner or like sign of one of the elemental tables that we're going to discuss in a second. So, um, I guess that's, that's it. Uh, one, one of the things um, that's more of an opinion or interpretation. Um, so the lamen is something that we wear on our chest, right? And it's, um, a, well, I guess a symbol or a representation of the um, mystical forces within us, right? the individual, the human being, the microcosm. And the table um, also, I guess, by the virtue of the hexagram, is uh, a representation of the macrocosm. What's very interesting here is that this um, table of letters at the bottom of there is rearranged to um, be perfect for the table and imperfect for the lamen. So it's a nice interpretation that the forces that um, we as individuals are made of are the exact same forces that the god, the absolute, is made of, but just in a slightly different arrangement. This is very complex, so I think also it's better if we um, go through things um, yeah, iteratively, um, every, every single part, um, should have a <laughs> question section, I guess. Go on. Yeah, uh, my question is, all the Enochian, the heptagrams, the sigils, the, the entire alphabet, did these come to, uh, to, um, Edward and, uh, and John D in, in visions or in the crystal ball, or how did they receive these? Well, uh, lots of different modes, I would say. So, um, for example, I, I mentioned that the outer ring of the sigil on the M is, uh, it was kind of like a vision and uh, an actual conversation. So they were seeing those angels, or Kali was seeing those angels with letters on their chests, and the angels would also read those letters to them. Uh, and generally speaking, um, Kali usually he saw um, everything during the operation in a crystal ball. If not, it was also explicitly mentioned that sometimes, you know, um, he would sometimes be randomly visited by angels when he was just, you know, doing his stuff. Um, like, you know, being just going to bed or something. Sometimes they would visit him in dreams and also um, pester him about it and, like, uh, give him some things um, to deliver later. Yeah, so this was, I guess... There were, there were many operations, um, like, uh, it, it, won't, it wasn't all delivered during a single day. It was actually, you know, many different days, um, sometimes uh, long uh, operations, uh, say, several hours. Uh, very often they would have breaks in between uh, for, like, lunch and stuff, because, you know, obviously it's just a lot of work. So every every detail, every letter usually was given to them um, letter by letter. Uh, or Kelly, at least, would maybe see the words in their entirety, but he still had to dictate it to D, uh, who couldn't see anything, letter by letter. 
So, so the Sigillum the Enna uh, actually has uh, also like just like the table that uh, you can see over here had its um, uh, maybe not origin, but like uh, it was uh, evidently inspired by some other grimoires. So, for example, so uh, yeah, I gave the example of Amadel, but the Sigillum the MF also has several um, earlier versions. One you can see in uh, Liber Euratus, which is one probably that that he was particularly um, inspired by. And the angels actually told them, like, you know, um, this uh, sigil on the MF that you can see in uh, Liber Euratus, you can use that one as a, mm -hmm. um, you know, like a um, f foundation. Yeah. Okay, I, I guess that sort of answers my question. Then it's either crystal ball or vision. I guess the only part I still don't understand is is why the person who was getting the vision wasn't the same person who was writing it down. Because I don't know how I could possibly describe that heptagram to you and have you in accurately several, write down the heptagram uh, cases, I'm seeing. In several cases, um, Kelly did write things down. Although, generally speaking, the angels would tell him that his job is to see stuff and this job is to be described so they were they didn't quite like it and also d was quite septic of kali um you know providing things on his own not necessarily because he like suspected him to like fake stuff but rather that he could probably um misinterpret things or miss things or you know if you have one person trans tr trying to translate these symbols and heptograms to another person by words only there's, it's going to be so incredibly error prone. So I'm just amazed. I'm, I'm sort of baffled uh, by the amount, quite, amount of work they were of, able like, to errors, accomplish. Uh, in like miscommunications and so on. And very often they uh, talk about them, and uh, every time I guess the gets something, like finishes something, he always asks the angels if what he created is correct. If uh, you know, if they um, approve like, of is his this creation. curve correct? Wow. Okay, that's kind of maddening, but that, I guess that answers my question. Yeah, so you see all these little cross, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, and they're everywhere. Could you say anything about this? So in the original, uh, like the template from uh, Liberi Euratus, we could see the crosses on the like the um, points of the heptagram, uh, and he asked about it, asked about the crosses, and the angels gave him a very um. um well, to some extent, they told him something like, you can place them anywhere, but they also told him where to place them. So it's kind of like, you know, um, I guess subject to uh, your interpretation. The general idea is, uh, so see here, we have in this one line, we have seven. Like, again, seven is a very important number in the system. So I think what they, what they kind of tried to do is to have seven of them where possible. And where it wasn't possible, they would just have, I don't know, two or something. I guess in most of cases they they are too, but the um, placement of them I don't think it has that much of a meaning to be honest. Um, it does have a meaning when we look at um, these, for example. Um, so there's this letter with like a cross on its end, and also here we have the X E. Yeah. X being also a cross, and I guess several other letters over there. There's an A with a cross, and so on. Um, so the angels were very specific about these ones, um, but um, not. I don't think it was really explained why. It's uh, I guess something that they really, really wanted there, um, but yeah, never, never really explained uh, any reason for it. I guess it has a symbolic value. You see it so much generally in Renaissance and, and uh, grimoire stuff, right? Is there anything from your experience and practice that you could say about this uh, outside the Enochian context? I guess there are two reasons. One, four um, ends of a cross corresponds to the four elements, which is the main thing in, I guess, the occult philosophy, uh, the main foundational uh, uh, division of forces. And also the cross in this particular context, but also in uh, some other grimoires, um, is uh, in existing reference to the um, Christ, uh, as in, you know, the death. Of Christ on the cross, and you know, cross being generally a Christian symbol. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. So uh, we'll proceed to the second part of the system. Um, we also talk about uh, all these parts at the end. Um, 
how they are interpreted or used nowadays by modern magicians, but we'll do that at the end. So, um, the second part of the system, um, it consists of, well, 49 tables like this one, or actually more of that, uh, and the angelic language. Um, you've already seen this uh, in the previous presentation. Um, this is, in my opinion, the most impressive part, because um, here, all these letters were again dictated letter by letter, and there's like lots of them, really lots of them. I think there's about a uh, hundred thousand uh, letters in total in this whole uh, creation um, over that, right? So it's extremely impressive. It's probably the biggest um, part of the system. But at the same time, it's one that is the most mysterious. We really don't know much about it. So, um, I guess if we go back, you can see these um, Enochian letters on the right side. Um, this is the Enochian alphabet. Um, they were received um, together with, with these tables. Um, and later on, they were told that this alphabet should be used for uh, the previous tools, such as the table, the lamen, and so on. Um, in Interestingly, not for the ring, though, and not for the signal on the MF, or at least not, but they weren't told that explicitly. Um, nevertheless, here we go. This is the Enochian alphabet. Um, similarly to the Hebrew language, and well, I guess some other languages like Greek, um, each letter has not only an actual uh, shape um, and meaning, but also a name. So, for example, here, the letter um, T, has the name Gisk. Um, the letter N has the name Drux. Um, so sometimes we use the names of the letters, uh, especially uh, later I'll tell you some modern methods that use them quite a lot. And sometimes the angels would also refer to the letters by those names, I guess, to make it um, clearer which letter is which. Um, the shapes themselves uh, were um, actually envisioned by Kelly, uh, and so since that's something uh, that cannot be <laughs> literally, you know, dictated, um, Kelly was given some sort of a vision external from the crystal. He could see basically the shapes of these letters uh, on the table as uh, some sort of light. So he then could put a paper on it on the table and just uh, using, uh, I don't know, a pen or whatever they were using, um, and just, you know, try to use those um, uh, lights as a guide to write these letters down properly. Um, because the first time he wrote them uh, as some kind of squiggles, the angels weren't quite satisfied with that. They, want, they, they wanted them to be like this, exactly. Um, so these letters um, are the alphabet of, of the Enochian language, but the uh, Enochian is not just an alphabet, it's actually an, a full language, or oh, well, <laughs> saying full is maybe foolish, uh -huh. but um, it does have many um, words, I guess, over so several hundred words that we can find in uh, the documents, and from these um, records we can see that it has actual grammar, um, you know, actual um, form of, in some cases, of conjugation. Um, it has its own rules like any other language. So um, we'll get to the source of these um, um, records in a moment. Um, but this, this language uh, has been, I guess, maybe not proven, but uh, analyzed by uh, actual linguists, and it is found to be an actual language, although, you know, linguists will say it is a constructed language. Nevertheless, uh, Edward Kelly, not only um, was he 26 at the time, or maybe 27 by this point, he didn't really speak languages other than English. He barely spoke Latin, and he actually learned Latin during the time he worked with the... Um, this um, table, or uh, this book of tables, um, had another language in it. So each of these tables is considered... Uh, I guess it sounds like an invocation. 
And this book is called Liber Logar, which is um, log Logar in Enochian meaning uh, speech of God, literally. So this book is um, said by the angels um, to be the actual words or sentences or whatever used by God to create the world. And this language, uh, so here we see it in the form of um, tables, but it was also dictated in the form of actual like sentences with each word divided. Um, and then linguists analyzed that other language or this language, and um, here they weren't able to find any actual uh, um, linguistic consistency. So it kind of is like gibberish, like in uh, many grimoires we find those barbaric names which don't seem to mean anything. So we have several translations of individual words, which is not enough to make any sense of this, um, but enough to, well, I guess, assume that it is supposed to be a real language. Um, so nobody has deciphered this as of yet. And, um, well, I frankly don't think uh, anybody will anytime soon. It's just way too complex. Um, maybe some forms of uh, AI would be helpful here to, like, find some patterns that we just cannot see. But, yeah, it's a, it's a system that pretty much cannot really be used by anybody at this point. Um, and obviously, well, nobody, none of, uh, like, modern practitioners really did anything. I mean, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so in this, um, system, or this part of the system, there is one operation called Gebofal, uh, or, or the holy art of Gebofal. Uh, we don't really know what that means exactly, but, um, it's a form of practice where we use angelic keys uh, or invocations to open each and every single one of these um, 49 tables. And angelic keys, I will explain in a moment, that's actually part of the third system. So again, we see how these um, subsystems, although they seem to be quite separate and um, decoupled, there are elements of those systems that seem to be uh, in direct relation to each other. Um, So here we see uh, something that is called the great table, actually two different tables. Um, these two differ not only uh, by the colors, but the letters that you see on the right side, even though they are written in Nokian, actually arranged it a bit um, differently. And uh, these tables, again, were uh, received pretty much letter by letter, uh, and they were created out of the table that we see over here or maybe not this one in particular, but like uh, some of these tables. So the angels would say, take the number, uh, the, take the row and column number X and Y and get the letter from there. And here you go, we get something like this um, in the end. Um, now, this is the third Enochian, the Enochiana, the Enochian system that we generally nowadays consider to be actually the main part of the Enochian system, or does this at least would be what we have um, that is kind of practical. And um, the main story of this system is that Dee and Kelly at that point uh, were um, told to travel to different places around the world. And so Dee asked the angels to um, get some methods that would not require all these tools that they had. Because obviously if you travel around Europe in this case, you don't want to uh, carry this massive table and all these tools, some of them very fragile, uh, around everywhere, you know? And that's how they got the, um, um, I guess that's how the angels um, got the idea of giving them this. Uh, and this is called the Great Table. Um, the Great Table of, I guess, um, Enoch in some cases, and sometimes just called the Great Table of the uh, Earth or the World. So it refers to the um, physical world, and uh, each of these individual beings is um, beings that you will uh, shortly um, discover in these tables are related to the material reality in some way. So each of them has a purpose uh, and, like, in an individual power to influence material uh, rea reality. 
uh, you can visibly see that um, this massive table on the left here um, is divided into four parts. In the middle, there being a cross again. Um, and each of these four parts is also divided into four smaller parts. Now, um, at this point, it shouldn't be um, surprising to anybody with any um, level of uh, occult knowledge that number four usually signifies four elements, and it's uh, quite uh, reasonable to assume the same in this case. So, um, obviously, we see each table has its own color, um, which uh, on the left side is slightly different to the ones on the right, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. And each um, of this, these tables represents also the four, uh, one of the four directions. So the table in the uh, upper left corner is the east. Um, then we have the south, west, and north. So basically it goes just uh, around it. Um, and each of these um, sections in the table um, has a different method of gaining names of the angels of this massive Enochian hierarchy. So we have a massive white cross on each of these tables, which has two columns and a horizontal row. The uh, horizontal, the middle horizontal row is, um, it has a um, a bunch of letters, I guess. Uh, and these are divided into three, four, and five. And these are the names of God in uh, this particular table. So, M-O-R-D-I-A-L, H-C-T-G-A. Um, the pronunciation of this is often quite weird. So, uh, there are different ways of pronouncing that, I guess. Um, many people try to find a, a particular pattern. Um, it's yeah it's it's not very easy um but uh we'll get to all this methodology in a second but let's just ignore the pronunciation for now uh let's just assume that um uh, h c t g a with like four consonants is pronounced something like hakitoga or something like that just for the sake of um explanation so um the um, white cross can be further divided into seven or actually six parts. So M or D R or M or D A could be read from the right to the left, and then we have uh, Adrum or Ladrum if we include the L. Then we have the um, the other half, which would be something like L Hectoga or something of that kind. So these six are called the seniors. So in the total, there's 24 of them uh, in all of the tables. And they are supposed to correspond to the 24, um, I guess, seniors or angels or whatever in the vision of um, John in Revelation. <clears throat> then uh, there's a strange thing here. Um, in the middle, if we take one of these uh, letters here on the left, the I, and we go all around this middle part, letter by letter, we arrive at something like Ichiha or, or Ichiho, um, I, or, well, this could be pronounced in many different ways, I guess, but basically something like this. Um, so it's a spiral pattern. Uh, uh, which is very interesting because uh, it refers to what is called a king. And well, since kings are often considered solar, although it uh, was slightly different in the system of Bonarum, um, it's interesting to see the spiral pattern as something that could be a, sig uh, a signification of um, solar centric um, idea, which is interesting because D himself, um, particularly when he wrote the Monada Hieroglyphica, he um, considered the world to be geocentric. <clears throat> so that's something interesting that we have this uh, um, king position in the middle. Now, if we go to um, the uh, smaller quadrants, we have something like a uh, 
Christian cross and uh, these um, names as can be read uh, from the top to the bottom and from left to right are again names of God uh, which have their own purpose which I'll explain in a second they can also be read from uh, the opposite direction so from the bottom to the top and from right to left but then there will be not so much a name of God but more of a um, kind of like demonic um, spell in a sense. I mean, it, it's meant to bind demons, not summon them, but we'll get again to, to that in a second. Uh, above the cross, we have something that is called um, cherubic angels. So, Boza or Boaza, because sometimes uh, the angels say that you can also add the middle letters to like lengthen their names, um, is then a cherubic angel of this quadrant. And um, obviously, again, we have uh, something like 16 of those Caribbean angels in all of the tables in total. Then below the cross, be below the horizontal uh, uh, part of the cross, cross, we have four um, beings called the servant angels. <clears throat> and these are, I guess, something like the lowest uh, beings in this hierarchy. Not so much the lowest of all Anokin beings, but we will get to that in a second again. And just like in the case of um, the Karubic Angels, we can also add the middle letters um, in between to lengthen these names. Um, so the uh, names of the cross are used something like uh, an aid to summon the Servant Angels. So we could say, in the name of Angpoi Unax, I summon you. Era, something of that kind, um, and um, these names don't really have any other purpose than like summoning. Uh, but the servant angels each have a slightly different function depending on where they are placed on the table. So again, it's not ex exactly precise in the description. Um, so technically speaking, each and every one of these four angels have the same purpose um, and they also have the same purpose as the ones in the upper left quadrant in the uh, other tables so over there over there and over here they all have the same um, ability but they are applied to different areas so since this um, table is considered both elemental and directional uh, the angels said something like um, this being a table of uh, north, the direction of north. If you want to influence northern regions of the world, you would use angels from this quarter. If you wanted to influence eastern, you would use the yellow quarter, and so on. Um, the elemental attributions are something that the angels didn't say explicitly, but it's very clear that it is it's implied very strongly we could say uh, nevertheless uh, nowadays we often interpret that as um, these uh, um, powers being also divided into different um, elemental attributions so i guess the quadrant um, the upper left quadrant of every single table um, has the seven angels with the power of healing and so, if we wanted to heal, say, a condition somehow related to the element of fire, I guess, I mean, just for an example, uh, something like a fever, because fever feels like you're burning, you know, you have high temperature and so on, um, then you could possibly use the um, healing angels from the table of fire. Now, um, there's another um, lower office or qua of beings called kaku demons and that literally means um evil, evil spirits the, the word demon in greek language means just a spirit it's not actually uh, an evil spirit but with the prefix kako it's an evil spirit and so um the Enochian system doesn't really have like evil beings in it um so the kaku demons are considered something more like um, lower beings. They are um, obviously they are part of 
everything else on this table. So the names of the Kaku demons are the first two letters of every ser servant angel. So it's just them two letters, um, nothing else. Um, and the angels seem to suggest that the number of letters in the name of a being is in direct relation to its intelligence. So obviously, we, we said earlier that the horizontal bar, um, the white cross, has um, a name basically of um, 12 letters, and that's how it is, you know, a name of God for the particular table. And then we have the seniors, which have seven letters. Uh, and then we have the king, which also has seven letters. Um, sometimes the name of a king can be lengthened. So the angels also said that in this case, for example, we have this like Ichihal. Um, it, it can be either Ichiha, Ichiho, or Ichihal with both letters. Then it would have eight. Um, and similarly, like I described earlier, we can add the middle letters from um, the white crosses, uh, the, the Christian crosses, to lengthen the names of the servant angels. And in the case of um, Kakodemons especially, we often also add the letters from the black cross, which combines the four tables. So to... Um, oh, my hand is lucky again. Uh, to... Um, lengthen the name of this Kakodemon, we would take the letter M from the, the black cross because it is in the same row. Uh, and this rule also applies to the Karubic angels above the cross. So the letter A here would be applied to Boaza, and that would be something like Aboaza, I guess. Um, this adding extra letters does not affect their powers, they are still the same beings, but it does affect their intelligence. So when we summon the Kaku demons, we only do so to bind them. Uh, that was very explicitly said by the angels. You don't summon them to do anything. They are not meant to achieve any results, even though they technically did describe um, their powers. They say that you should um, summon them and bind them. And the summoning and binding occurs by the use of, again, the white cross. And these are the reverse names that I mentioned earlier. So we will use the um, the um, vertical name, reversed, to summon the spirit, and the horizontal one to bind it. And by doing so, by binding those Kaku demons, uh, what we achieve is basically uh, we bind them to the uh, to further the will of God. So, since Kalkodemons are kind of part of the Servant Angels, they are treated as unbalanced forces. So, the binding process is a form of balancing them, to put them back to um, the original arrangement. And that is very similar to what we've seen earlier with the um, Holy Table and Laman, right? Here and uh, here. We rearrange these beings slightly to um, make them more perfect, in a sense. One of the powers described uh, ascribed to the Kakodemons was finding treas treasures. And that's something that the Inkeli were very interested in, obviously. Uh, who wouldn't want to find a treasure? But the problem with that is uh, when they actually asked the angels about those treasures, they said, no, these are not material treasures, these are spiritual treasures, these are tre treasures within you. Um, and so, uh, I don't think they ever attempted doing anything about that, <laughs> ironically. Now, um, one of the weird things about this system is, um, if we even um, ignore the entire complexity of this hierarchy, uh, and I guess there's also like many different methods of getting the names uh, that the angels have not described. So nowadays we um, speculate that we could also read um, the names uh, vertically. Uh, so in this case, I guess something like, uh, well, which one is easy to read? Baori, 
that would be another being uh if we um if we assume that we can also read these angels um in in different ways which is something that the angels did hint at they said uh in one of the visions that there was like a uh the vision was of uh, four watchtowers which refer to the four tables from each of the watchtowers they uh proceeded several beings several numbers of beings something like a trumpeter um some oh, the six seniors the um the king uh five princes which nobody really knows who they are we all speculate that the princes are uh created in a similar way to the kings with a spiral pattern but on the smaller crosses but then the problem is where where is the fifth one right uh and similarly at the end there was a multitude of beings an uncountable number of beings from every single watchtower so technically speaking there are definitely other methods of de designing these names but the angels just did not disclose them uh to their uh, um opinion what we got was enough um so i guess it's possible to discover more but it's not really necessary um before we proceed with the next part is um we see these two tables uh, are very different and i don't just mean the letters obviously um so something you probably cannot see because you cannot read the Anokian alphabet is that the table over there is not just it doesn't just have different colors it has all these all, all these letters uh, that we can see on the table on the left or um, all these four tables completely re re rearranged so um the table at the top is the same it's also uh, the same as the one uh, which you see in yellow here um but the table uh, the black table over here uh is actually the red one over here so yeah it's uh, all ip and it's also here all ip and so on um the table over here um uh well so like i said this letter here is p therefore this letter is also p <laughs> Uh, and that um, corresponds to the one over there, the blue one, MPH. Uh, and obviously that leaves us with the black one in the upper right corner. So why is that? Um, when Dean and Kelly originally got this table, they actually got the, the one on the right. Um, but then after some years, Angels uh, came up and said, you know what, we, we want them in a different order. And that complicates things quite quite uh, hardly because, well, if we do so, suddenly um, the letters that we need to add to the names of, well, for example, Kakodemons are entirely different. So in, in here we had the, for the Kakodemon A, we had the letter M, but if we change that, it will be an entirely different letter to an entirely different uh, being. Uh, and the same obviously applies to the, the like the um carobs and all the other uh, angels so um nowadays practitioners tend to use both of them for different purposes uh but i don't think that's necessary and in fact reading the um original diaries when we read uh, the examples for um the um Kakodemon and Kakodemons and the carobs like the expansion of the names um, the examples were actually given to the one table that did not change its uh, pattern. It's the, the one that is in top left, the one that is still in the same place in both of these versions. Um, so we, th there is no conflict there to you know to um, change these entirely. Um, and I personally, in my opinion, prefer to use only the newer version. Um, before we proceed, one thing, the colors are actually wrong on the left side. Or maybe they are not quite wrong as much as they are a uh, newer interpretation. Uh, the colors that we see in the original diaries are the ones on the right. So the east is red, um, the south is white, the west is green, and the north is black. Uh, well, black is, I, I guess, uh, the same. But since the tables are rearranged, then different uh, elemental attributions are um to given to different tables and that's quite, quite problematic as we will uh, discover in a, in a second 
I guess I should have probably used this table now that I think about it because the letters are much bigger. <laughs> um, but um, basically, uh, the angels gave us the angelic keys that uh, I mentioned earlier in relation to Liber Logar. And uh, these keys or calls, um, they're called keys because they open the tables of Loga, but they also say said to be calls because they are used to call uh, the angelic hierarchy. Um, and these calls, um, there's, well, technically there is um, 48 of them, but in practice there's actually just 19. Um, so we have 18 calls. Um, which are very different from each other. And then we have one call which only changes a single word um, to refer to the remaining 30 um, calls. And as I just said, 48, not 49, because supposedly the first um, table of Liber Logar was never meant to be open. It's like the you know ultimate God speech that cannot ever be pronounced by a human being or comprehended or whatever. Um, and um, there's many interpretations how these calls relate to these tables, which we'll get into in a moment. But the final uh, key or call, uh, the 19th one, is a call of so-called 30 eaters. So 30 heavenly spheres above the earth. Like I said earlier, the um, great table is meant to represent the material world. And beyond it, there is 30 spheres of um, something like spiritual uh, realms, which are something like concentric circles. So one is um, contained within each other and in the um, innermost place, we have the great table. So um, some people that might be familiar with Gnosticism can see the pattern of 30 eaters being um, similar to the 30 aeons in the Gnostic writings. And in fact, some of the angels in the Anakin system, like uh, particularly um, one female angel uh, called Galua, is considered to be Sophia, because she was literally said by the angels to mean wisdom. Uh, and she was also the one to deliver the final um, um, table of Loga, the 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 one that is actually you know un unpronounceable and so on. So there are some um, relations to the Gnostic system, I guess. Um, nobody really knows how much, and you know it, it hasn't been studied well yet. Maybe there is uh, there are some very clear um, connections, but we just don't know yet. Um, these thirty eaters are also. Um, they have another hierarchy of beings under them. So, apart from the bottommost uh, eater, which has four rulers, each of them has three rulers, which uh, ends up being 91 so called rulers, again, or governors. Uh, each of them, these are, is meant to govern a particular place on Earth. Not in a literal sense, you know, but. Uh, it's something like a spiritual governor of, uh, of a particular region. Each of these uh, governors um, has a, a name which is actually composed from the tables. So what you see on the, the right side um, is kind of something like seagulls or squibbles which uh, make out the sigils of the governors. Now, if you think about it, it's bloody crazy that all these letters are rearranged in not only like a hierarchy of beings of the great table, but also match these sigil patterns on the right. It's just mind blowing uh, to me personally. <laughs> um, so obviously each table has its own uh, collection of um, governors. And each of these governors um, is, it corresponds to like a different part of the earth. I'm not going to talk too much about it because it's very complex, but basically 
um, they received something like a map of the world, not a graphic map, but like a description of 91 parts of the Earth. Each of these parts relates to an actual country or group of countries or regions on the physical Earth or planet. Uh, again, interesting is that there are some that, you know, um, people during these times didn't really know about. Um, kind of, again, a supernatural confirmation of the system. Uh, and, well, basically, um, this system, or this part of the system, is something like a form of um, influencing politics, in a sense. <laughs> so, uh, um, I guess the Nokian system is kind of, um, we could say, powerful in the sense that it, it, it tries to um, influence people in power, uh, as well as the material, um, you know, situations, just like everyday situations. We see that this was the case for John D. Uh, and Kali themselves, as they were traveling um, over Europe, and the angels would often tell them to go to this so emperor, like one of the most important people in Europe, or the Polish king, which was at the time one of the biggest countries in Europe. And they would actually, you know, try to influence those powerful people um, by, like, you know, uh, telling them about the system. They try to get them involved in the system. It's very, very interesting, but um, we don't really know much um, about any potential results from this practice. Uh, some people uh, try this, but we don't have many people actually telling us, um, telling everybody else uh, what the results are. Uh, okay. Um, anything else here? Uh... Oh, uh, one more thing, the 30 eaters, uh, um, this, uh, they, since they are considered heavenly spheres, they also, um, something like a spiritual progression, or at least, um, I mean, that was lightly hinted at by the angels, and uh, in the modern times, they are generally considered to be a form of spiritual progression, just like the tree of life would. Um, and um the um remaining 18 calls although they weren't said explicitly by the angels to refer to any particular table uh nowadays very often we use them as such so we say that the um the first two um calls relate to the black cross in the middle and the remaining calls um well which is um 16 calls refer to the um, 16 quadrants. Um, so, uh, the quadrant which corresponds to the table of the same kind, so for example, the bottom left quadrant of the bottom left um, table also corresponds to the entire table in a sense. Um, and this method um, was devised by the Golden Dawn, and that's one of the um, most practical interpretations of the Enochian system. Um, one that mm, some people might not agree with. So the, the practice in this way would be basically to, you know, uh, use the calls, to actually recite the calls, and then uh, call the uh, great tables hierarchy um, one by one, um, going down to the lowest servant angels. Um, but in this, um, in, in, in these uh, diaries, we can actually see the operation for uh, working with the Great Table was meant to be something very Solomonic uh, or Abramelic, where we could see basically a 19-day operation of summoning every single uh, angel individually um, with just, you know, prayers and uh, angels didn't really say much about these prayers. Uh, they said that you should create them yourself, um, you know, be just your own invention. Um, and yeah, I mean, they didn't actually, um, yeah, expect anything of this kind like we do nowadays. Nevertheless, um, like Benjamin Rose said, this system is very effective, uh, even if we don't use it in the right way, as we could think. And I guess changing some elements slightly can affect the um, effectiveness highly, but it's effective nevertheless. So. What we see over here is the promised modern interpretations. 
uh, I guess we'll uh, start with the uh, Enochian topic and then go back to the others. Um, first, let's start with what we see on the right side. Uh, the top right thing uh, you, you have already seen in the previous presentation. These are the so-called uh, cut pyramids. Uh, these refer to basically the, ta the gray table. And this is a golden dawn interpretation, which um, basically attributes to each of the squares an extra two, uh, extra four sides, each with its own uh, elemental and planetary and other correspondences. Um, this is a very golden dawn thing to do, I guess. Um, it makes the tables even more complex. Uh, uh, Surprisingly, um, and as you see on the bottom uh, bottom right, there's um, each of the squares in the table of air, which we see over here, um, and which you can disc uh, recognize by the um, color of yellow, which is, seems to be very prominent in the table. Um, each square is actually entirely different, so there is not a single square in the entire gray table which would have the uh, same four sides which is again very interesting um but yeah this is a modern invention there's nothing in the uh, tables uh, sorry in the diaries that would suggest that it should be done in this way um so it is quite interesting uh, and uh, some people use it um i know that for example lonmilo de Keter, uh uses it he has it, his own um, pyramid um, tables actually I personally um, learned about it, um, but I didn't really use them uh, uh, for the, the beginning, uh, since uh, my original practice was more in the line with uh, the, Enochian, uh, the Golden Dawn system, but I since then uh, moved away from it. And so, um, one of the um, other modern inventions is actually the colors themselves. So, I guess Adelia. These tables uh, not only are uh, arranged in a different way, they actually have entirely different colors. Uh, and the difference is uh, actually Golden Dawn's fault. Like, um, the colors that we see on the left are something that the Golden Dawn employs in their system. Whereas the colors that we see on the right are the ones that uh, John Dee uh, has described in his diaries. Now, um, these colors on the right actually have a little um, <clears throat> problem um, because they are used in two different places, one which is the vision of watchtowers and one which is in the vision called uh, Run House. And uh, in the vision of Run House, we have the attribution of elements and those colors, but they are slightly different. So um, in the Run House, the color red is applied to air and white to fire, which is a bit counterintuitive. Um, so I think um, there is a mistake there, probably on the Kali's part. <laughs> um, in the Watchtowers, they are described uh, more uh, in what in, in line of uh, w with what we see um, on the slide over here. So um, red being uh, fire, and also again uh, one of the things uh, that is very different is that fire is in the east. So on the left side. We have this golden dawn table, and in the golden dawn system, the element of air is in the east, and then we have the um, element of fire in the south, an element of water in the west, an element of earth in the north. In the Enochian or original Enochian system, it's very different. Um, east is fire, and um, the opposite to it, so the west is water, which is, well, uh, kind of similar, I guess, but the difference is that earth and air and fire and water are the elements that are oppositions of each other, right? Because earth is heavy, air is light, fire is, well, hot and dry, water is wet and um, uh, cold, so there are oppositions, and in the Enochian system, they actually are in their opposite positions. Um, so. This is more in line with the ancient Hermetic tradition, uh, which I guess uh, I personally prefer. And it's also very interesting for me personally, because 
when I was working with not only Enochian, but actually some other beings, um, they told me that um, I should use this pattern, the hermetic pattern of fire in the east and so on. Um, so for me personally, um, this makes more sense, uh, which is, I guess, the main reason why I left the Golden Dawn system. Um, because again, um, the Golden System depends heavily on this direction, on these four directions and these four elements, and they're entirely different than the Nokian system. So there's a massive, um, I guess, um, conflict there, something that cannot be easily resolved. Now, um, I don't know if you would like me to describe um, functionality of these. Angels. I, can, I guess I can read that in any, any sort of book. On the left side here, we have um, two different inventions. Uh, at the bottom are something, something called the Nokian Tarot, which is not really a tarot, and it's not exactly a Nokian either. Um, we we see um, the on the left side there is a reference to the one of the eaters, and on the right side one of the angels of the Great Table. Uh, this is made by uh, Gerald Schuller, which had many, many um, inventions of, of, of the Enochian kind, which have zero relationship to the original diaries, I guess. Um, there's absolutely no reason to connect Tarot with the Enochian in this way. Uh, if you use the uh, Golden Dawn system, that you could probably do that in some way, but the way he did it is absolutely weird. Um, I included this particular card because it's actually interesting that it, it kind of reminds me of one of my own uh, etheric visions, but yeah, other than that, I don't really see any value in it, and many uh, like, uh, practitioners find Schroeder's inventions. Uh, one of others that I might m mention is um, something called Enochian Yoga, which is kind of weird, and um, Enochian Physics, which is something like a explanation of how world works again not very um um in line with the Nokian system as it was originally given yeah i mean this is one of those very strange inventions i just wanted to share and like warn people against it um at the top left uh what you see is a visualization of an astral temple uh this was designed by benjamin rowe um it's in my opinion, quite cool, uh, and it is made out of the again the the, the uh, squares from the great table made into cubes uh, and arranged in a particular pattern. Uh, the pattern is kind of I guess it's not really wrong. It's not nothing special about it. I guess I don't really find it particularly um, um, interesting. But the whole concept of having an astral and looking temple, I think, I find uh, very fun. Um, and obviously there are um, lots of other um, inventions in terms of how this system should be practiced because obviously there weren't enough information, uh, there wasn't enough information in the original diaries. So, for example, the um, um, the call of the 30 eaters, um, like I said earlier, it only changes one single word to refer to a different eater. And Crowley actually suggested that another word could be changed. Um, another um, difference, or well, interpretation or expansion of the Nokian system would be all sorts of other ideas Crowley had uh, and added to his uh, um, philosophy of Telema. So the idea that we you might heard of might have heard of like Coronzon or Babylon and uh, the triumphant child. Um, all these are, can be found in the Nokian diaries. Um, so I guess he kind of interpreted certain things in his own phallic way and um, expanded the system to mean um, his phallic uh, uh, way. <laughs> um, other inventions by the Golden Dawn um, would be um, something like the Table of Union. So. In the great table um, over here, we have this massive black cross in the middle, and it has um, actually four names, which seem to refer to the elements themselves. And uh, oh, sorry, someone's calling me. I need to. Okay. Um, and um, they arranged these four names into a table, uh, which is something like a spiritual table or table of union. 
and again it refers to the four elements um these tables are heavily used in the um golden dawn rituals both the initiation rituals and so on um I personally used it for a while. I don't, no longer use it. Um, there's a slight indication in the diaries that it could be made into a table, but yeah, it wasn't ever clearly explicitly said so. Um, one other thing is that uh, Golden Dawn has invented many of those different ways of getting extra beams from the tables. Again, not going to go into details, no point, you can, you know, read books that I will, uh, some of which I will recommend at the, at the end. Um, and also, the Golden Nun uh, has invented a method that I actually personally like, um, with the usage of the calls. So, like I said earlier, the two the first two calls are attributed to the Black Cross, or the Table of Union, and the four, um, and the remaining 16 calls to the four um, quadrants, or sub-quadrants of the four quarters. Um, Based on the uh, pyramids uh, and their elemental attributions and so on, uh, Gondodon has also designed a method to describe angels, uh, their visuals. That's something I personally don't like. Uh, I don't think we should intellectualize the way that angels appear to ourselves. They, that should be completely subjective. Um, and I guess one last mention of uh, Nokian uh, modern magic is um, invention by uh, um, Scott Stenwick. Uh, he created a way of um, designed a way of creating sigils for the angels of the Great Tables. Um, I'm not going to describe it in detail. I'm going to recommend his book at the end, so you'll uh, find it there. Oh, and one thing that I learned from a uh, uh, Portuguese, I think, order, uh, Seculo Iniciatico uh, de Hermes, is a way of Scrying the eaters by the use of the sigils that we see on the right. So since every eater has a corresponding um, group of governors, we can also use these sigils to kind of align ourselves with a particular eater, I guess. Uh, very interesting method and one that actually was probably also uh, invented by Schuller, which is probably the only invention of his I read that wasn't gibberish. Um, going back to the system of logach. I guess at earlier there's not much anybody did uh, with it, and only Aaron Leitch, uh, one of the um, uh, writers about the Nokian, uh, has actually written about the Holy Art Gebofal operation, um, and he's in process of writing another book that is supposed to actually um, create, well, make it practical, but so far it's uh, just a promise. And we go to the heptarchic um, system. Now, um, here there's a few interpretations. So like I said earlier, it was originally ignored by the Golden Dawn. Uh, like they, they did know about it. It was included in their materials for the higher grades. But they never, or Samuel Mattis never um, described any methodology of how to work with them. So nobody really did anything. And... Um, yeah, there's a few uh, methods designed by modern magicians to work with this table. Uh, I personally like the one invented by Lon Milo Duquet, uh, which is something like a recitation of uh, all those different letters on the table and so on. So, um, I'm, again, I'm not going to go into details. I recommend his book uh, at the end, um, which is, his book was one of the earliest that had a very good... Um, overall description of the system. Um, yeah, it's uh, not perfect. No, not the books are perfect, but it's still valid. There's many different interpretations on how to use the language. Um, I personally find that um, it is something like a programming language in a sense. So um, the angel said that this language is the, uh, the language of um, paradise. This is the language that angels and heavenly beings were taught in paradise in a sense uh, and uh, they literally said that use the usage of this language influences reality um, right away like uh, if you speak the name of water in um, in the Nokian it shall tremble and that kind of stuff so uh, I find it to be something like the code of material reality it is uh, um, I personally 
designed a method that is called a Nokian script, which is basically writing down in a Nokian uh, what you want and um, make it into something like a talisman that you carry with yourself or um, put in a place that is meant to be affected. Um, another way is to basically use them as um, the language as spells, I guess, design spells and recite them. Something similar to the Nokian calls, but just, you know, again, with your own intention. But the problem is that, um, well, pronunciation. Uh, in these diaries, we see he made many of notes on how to pronounce certain words, uh, but there are, the rules are not um, always very consistent, uh, like with many languages, I guess. Uh, so there are many ways to um, simplify that pronunciation, and Golden Dawn has, has its own method, which I personally don't like. They basically said that if we have a word which is, I guess, let's say, take something like um, one of these names, or what, what, one which would be difficult to um, pronounce, say, uh, O-R-P-M-N, or O-R-M-N, they would say that uh, each letter can be treated as a Hebrew letter, so R would be um, Resh, and take the next vowel from the name of that Hebrew letter, which in Resh is E, and put that in between. So um, M is also Mem, which is which again has a letter M. So that would be something like Oremen. And well, I mean, as much as it is a easy method, an easy method to use, uh, it's very wrong. <laughs> it's completely different from what these words sound in the original um, manuscripts. So um yeah so I, I personally don't like that i think it's better to just actually learn this uh by heart if, if necessary um for every single operation that they're used in um and i guess as a last note um so um the um pronunciation um lonmild cat said something uh very important i guess that we're talking to angels, we're talking to higher beings which can technically read our thoughts and all sorts of messages that we get from them are usually translated into our own languages and uh, um, not just the um, human languages but also all the symbols that we know, all the philosophies that we are uh, aware of. So um, we shouldn't worry too much about pronunciation uh, and he gave a nice uh, metaphor of humans to uh, angels look like mice. Uh, and even Mouse walked on your shoe and started speaking squeaky English, you would not only think it's adorable, you would also probably understand it even if it wasn't entirely correct. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I uh, subscribe to that. Don't worry too much about pronunciation in this case. So, uh, in the last slide, I give you a list of um, books that I personally uh, used and like and well actually use regularly um at the top we have like modern guides by Lonnie Ludicat, Aaron Leitch, uh, Frate Yehida who was uh, uh who's a member of uh, was a member of um one of the modern golden dawn systems um and then we have Scott Michael Stanwick um Stanwick has uh well his book is in a sense worse than the previous ones, uh, but also it is one that is most correct in terms of all these attributions, so it's most closely uh, related to the originals. Um, then we have dictionaries, which are, um, well, dictionaries of the Anakin language. One is by Donald Playlick, which is act an actual uh, uh, linguist, and it's a really um, detailed analysis of the language. Um, but also, I uh, gave you one uh, which is simpler, Jim Kalzema by Leo Vinci, is one that I personally most use. It's a very simple one, uh, very easy to use it um, to create scripts or spells. And at the bottom we have the source material. Uh, we have the Kevin, Kevin Klein's um, um, Complete uh, Diaries, which is an actual uh, massive three-volume book with... Um, very detailed um, copies of the manuscripts. It's transcribed, so it's very, very easy to read, but he replicated even like smudges on the manuscripts. So it's well, bloody amazing, in my opinion. And it's not that expensive. 
I paid 80 pounds for it. Um, and then we have Justin Patterson and Steven Skinner. So um, the problem with Kevin Klein, uh, Klein's um, manuscripts is that Kelly obviously, uh, sorry, D obviously uh, wrote most of it in, in English, but some of it in Latin. So if you are uh, not familiar with Latin, uh, Kevin Klein's uh, um, book will not be enough for you to fully um, understand what's written. Um, so we have two translations, uh, one which is for the five, uh, first five books, uh, Patterson's translation, which includes the translations of Latin, uh, um, and Skinner's edition with uh, the remaining, well, maybe not all of the books, but some of the remaining books, again, with translations of Latin. Um, yeah. Um, I guess that's all. Let's uh, do some questions. If you have a question, uh, please get uh, to the side of the room. Let's pretend there's a microphone over here. Um, yeah, I can get in line. Okay, well, go ahead. I was just going to ask, when I studied the Rigori or the Watchers, it was made pretty evident at the time that the pronunciation was really important of the names. And I was wondering, on, based on your opinion, do you think that bypassing the pronunciation of such sacred names, it ruins the etymology of the origin, considering a lot of the names when spoken are spelled? So I would say that, um, obviously we, would, we should try to be as accurate pos as possible, but what we have left of the system um, is probably not enough to be fully accurate with everything. So a lot of that has to be the interpretation. But Angels often said, uh, and that's also, um, you know, in this case, when there was some inconsistency, they told us to just do the work and see what happens and, you know, verify the results um or verify the inconsistencies by the results so for example um like i mentioned earlier um there is uh there was this double way of creating the names of the kings and the angels more or less said that one of the letters sorry this one oh well actually could be this one as well one of the letters is meant to represent mercy and the other is meant to justice justice or like severity in, in a sense uh, which is very kabbalistic also um but d wasn't exactly convinced with uh convinced by this explanation and he wanted to know more about what they mean and well the angels told him to just you know summon the angels ask them or see what happens and you know uh, they basically said if you do the work it will be self-evident so I guess they encourage us to work with the system even if we have incomplete uh, information um, because it's just going to clear so clear itself uh, up on its own. Thank you. Yeah, that kind of falls in line also with a bunch of um, other Grimoire traditions, right? Where basically it's um, a bit of a, an interface to get you in contact with these intelligences, but um, you know, from, from there on out, the, the practice is detailed by these uh, interactions with these intelligences. Um, I mean, at least that's like a recurring theme I'm hearing. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, I, I gave a single example, but there's lots of this in uh, this kind of interaction in, in the diaries. Yeah. Do we have any other questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, I don't go ahead. Yeah. How yeah, about... I have at least a couple of questions. Uh, one is, did the angels ever explain to them why they were giving the summoning names and binding names for these chaotic spirits, the Aters, as you described them? Yeah, like I said, they didn't explicitly explain every single thing about it, obviously, but they said that these names are used to, um, well, the beings are meant to, meant not they are not meant to be summoned, they are only meant to be bound so they are not meant to be used they are meant to be bound uh which only hints at some sort of mystical uh, operation here and they also said that um 
well, like I said earlier, they do have some uh, powers ascribed to them, or at least some of them, and that the powers uh, relate to some hidden treasures uh, within ourselves. So, oh, yeah, um, it relates one of my to other the, I guess, it relates to the system of macabre mysticism where um, the heavenly journey is actually ascribed, uh, described as going in inwards rather than outwards. Uh, and you also find that in the Sumerian tradition, you don't really go um, down to, don't go up, up to heaven, but you're going down to hell or, or, well, the underworld as they described it. And you would um, kind of bind these different um, beings that you found on your way as a form of, um, I guess, um, purifying yourself. And this is directly uh, linked to the macabre mysticism, where you're also going down and you bind every single uh, angelic being or guardian of the palaces that you meet to, in a sense, help yourself, like improve yourself. So with each um, of these um, beings that you encounter, you um, make them into your chariot which, with which you, you know, descend or ascend the heavens. Ah, oh, okay, so it's not like the angels are approving of all these lower entities, but they see these lower entities as like obstacles or um, or challenges you can you can overcome to improve yourself. Well, yeah, they are like inf imperfections that are just present. And uh, I guess similarly to the Kabbalistic idea of uh, Tikkun, uh, which is, you know, the uh, fixing of, of the uh, reality after uh, Shavira, after the breaking of the vessels, after, you know... Um, leaking out the evil uh, into the world. Um, Tikkun is a form of, I guess, also karmic relationship in, like in Hinduism and, and yoga. So everyone you can make the world to, right again through this ritual. Yeah, you try to improve yourself so that, you know, you improve the world until we reach the ultimate reality, uh, which is, uh, I guess, the revelation or apocalypse, uh, apocalyptic um, unity, uh, destruction of unity of everything. And you are the world, essentially. Like, when you are writing these things, you are writing your world as well as the outer world, inside and outside. Yeah, well, you, being the microcosm, you unify yourself with the macrocosm. So the div, um, division between the inner and outer becomes non-existent. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That's kind of similar to the, um, the Hawaiian kahuna tradition. They have what's called lana kohiki, the deep realm. But uh, apparently you have these two types of shamans in the Hawaiian tradition. One, one is called the adventurer shamans, and the others are called the healer shamans, I think. I'm, I'm not sure how that interprets out. But the, the adventurer shamans are the ones, instead of healing people, they just go deep into the nightmare realms and they do battle with all sorts of things to, to sort of gain their power and improve their power type. And it's, it's sort of interesting how there's almost a similarity there. Uh, I was going to give an example of, like I said earlier, the Kakodemons do have um, attributed some sort of office of power and the kakodemons are uh, that are created or creating the names of uh the seven angels that i uh i think i mentioned like the so the upper um upper left uh quadrant the seven angels in that quadrant have the power of healing and the kakodemons of that same quadrant have the power of causing illness so there is an indication here that the cacodemons are basically uh, uh, the same kind of force, but reverted or, or imbalanced. So what you try to do, I guess, in healing, you try to bind a cacodemon that causes illness, in a sense. Because I guess it's a bit like um, atoms. Like, if you put two atoms together, they create something different. But if they are separate, they don't do anything. They are actually, um, they could be, like, destructive, like, in the sense of an atom bomb, if, you know, if you can cause a chain reaction. Um, you cause this, well, uh, very destructive um, explosion. And I, I find cacodemons in a similar way. They are so um, small and imbalanced that you cannot really use them for anything. Uh, in fact, the, invoking them would be destructive. It would be like unbinding the atoms. Uh, so my, my uh, next question is... Um, do we know any of the the divine treasures 
Uh, do we have an example of one of the divine treasures that, say, John Dee found within himself or Edward Kelly found within himself? I don't think so, not really. Uh, like I said in the previous um, lecture, half or possibly more than half of the uh, documents in, from the later years after this system was delivered have been destroyed. So we don't really know oh. what they did, what they didn't do. Because it would actually reveal the angels' philosophy, like their their whole goal, you know, what their whole end game is, if we actually knew what they considered to be treasures and what they considered not to be treasures. So that's interesting. Oh well. Yeah, unfortunately, and, uh, uh, and that's well partly why this system is so you know fragmentary because that's why we have to fill in so much. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. Hope you learned something. Hope that I wasn't too chaotic about my explanation. And uh, yeah, my angels be with you. <laughs>